So let's recap. First, we've collected all of our inputs. We have everything out of our head. Then we've clarified what everything is and decided what to do about it. Next, we need to organize those things so we can engage with the things based on what it is and when we need it. Hey everyone, welcome or welcome back, Organizing Higher. Every Tuesday, I share a video where I talk about GTD or task managers, or just in general, productivity and organization tips, tools, and resources. Consider subscribing if you're into stuff like that. This is video number three in my series on how I'm using it to do it with GTD. If you haven't seen my first two videos on capture and clarify, make sure you start there first and then come back here. So when it comes to the organize step, I don't want this video to be 30 minutes long. So I'm just going to cover the basics of the step. Specifically, I'm going to talk about the types of things that you might need to organize as you're going through your GTD workflow. And I'll give a couple of examples of tools that I use to organize myself, including Todoist and OneNote. Before we get started, just a quick favor. If you find anything in this video helpful, or useful for you, please hit the thumbs up button. That does a couple of things. Number one, it gives me feedback that you like the stuff that I'm talking about. And number two, YouTube uses that as a sign that other people might like this video and they recommend it to other people as well. So it helps get the word out about my channel and it's really motivating for me. Okay, let's get started. So the GTD book outlines seven different types of items that you'll likely need to organize. And the seven things are a list of projects, project support material, scheduled actions on your calendar and information to support those, a list of next actions, a list of things you're waiting for, reference material, and a list of things you'd like to do someday, maybe. Now, depending on the work that you do, you might find that you don't need all of these different lists, or maybe you need a list that's not one of these, but these are really the primary ones to get you started. So for the rest of this video, I'm just going to go through each of the types of lists and talk about how I'm using tools like Todoist to keep myself organized. First up is the projects list. This is pretty easy with Todoist because making a project is built into the UI. So you're just able to go in and create a project. If you don't know how to create a project, it's pretty easy. You just click the plus button. You're able to create a title for your project, add any kinds of color coding that you want. I list all of my active projects alphabetically just along the side there. I find it's a lot easier and faster for me to find a project. And then in the style of GTD, I always try to use outcome-based titles. So instead of clean my house, have a clean house is my project name. I don't add any emojis or anything like that to my projects because it's just extra visual clutter for me. I do differentiate work projects from personal projects only visually. So the different colors, blue for work projects and purple for personal projects. I have a couple other colors that are in there that are just kind of maybe one-off projects or aren't necessarily connected to either work or personal, but I still have them all in one alphabetical list because I want to still be able to see all of my projects at one time, regardless of whether they're work-related projects or personal projects. I also like that during my weekly review, I'm able to really quickly look down my projects list and you can see the little number after the project title and see if there's at least one thing in that project. And then I just quickly look to make sure that at least one of those tasks in that project has a next action label associated with it. I don't engage too much with the project during the weekly review, depending on how much time I have. It's just to really quickly remind myself of what my projects are and their basic status. When it comes to project support, there's three places that I keep this material. The first is email. In my other video, I talk about my GTD email folder setup and I have project support folders for certain email heavy projects that I'm working on. That way it's easy to reference any kind of email conversations that we've had. The second place is in Todoist itself. I'll place a comment in the project comments, not in the task comments, but I can add quick notes to myself or any files that I need to have or photos or things like that. It's good to just be able to reference that really quickly when I'm looking at a project if I need to. And the last place is within OneNote. I use OneNote for kind of heavier duty things is how I'm going to describe it. Stuff that I want to have a bit more flexibility with. The comment section in Todoist is a lot more static. You can't do things like highlighting. So with OneNote, if I have notes or any type of support within a project, I can use the really powerful search feature to find the things that I need for that particular project. And then I can highlight stuff if I want it to stand out. I can insert PowerPoint slides that I can then write on and take notes. So I really like using OneNote for like heavier duty project support. The next area is scheduled actions on the calendar. So I mostly use Microsoft Outlook for my calendar, my main calendar at work, but on my phone, I actually use Google Calendar and I have it synced so that I'm able to see my Outlook and Google appointments just via the Google Calendar. I actually don't really use Google Calendar to add appointments much. I just add everything to my Outlook calendar 
calendar because most of what I'm doing is for work. But if I'm adding things that are like private or personal on my work calendar, then I might you just use the private feature so you can make a calendar entry private so other people aren't able to see that I'm you know, having playtime with my daughter on Sunday morning or something like that. If I want to remind myself of something like a due date or a birthday or that I need to rotate my mattress or change my toothbrush, I put that as an all day event and it's really just a reminder. I used to put this kind of stuff in Todoist, like I would have a list of chores that I needed to do and I would just have it be like every Tuesday or every two weeks on Tuesday, I want to clean the bathroom. But I just started to be repelled by that for some reason. I don't know what it is about my brain, but I would see that I needed to clean the bathroom on Tuesday and I would not clean the bathroom on Tuesday. And of course, being able to see that it's an overdue task the next day made me feel some type of way. So I just moved it to my calendar and it's just a reminder because I don't actually have to clean the bathroom on Tuesday. It's just that on Tuesday, I should think about the fact that I should probably start wanting to clean the bathroom. And then during my weekly review, when I'm reviewing my upcoming week, I will note that there is something like that coming up that I need to change my toothbrush or rotate my mattress or whatever. And then I'll just put that on my next actions list for that week. That way I'm still likely to do it because it's on my list of next actions, but I'm not concerned about doing it by a certain date. I don't know why I just respond better to it this way. And the trick is to do what works for you, right? So that's what works for me. The next list is a list of all of your next actions. I did an entire video on my to do a setup with GTD and I'll link that in the description box if you haven't seen that. But I use mostly labels and filters to basically automatically create a next actions list. I use contexts like location and energy and time to differentiate where I'm able to do certain things. And I really love doing this. I find this works really well for me for having like buckets of all of the errands that I could do or all the emails that I can send or everything that I need to do at a computer. I have a computer next actions list and that's different from my internet next actions list because there are some instances where I have a computer, but I don't have internet. So with a computer, I can do things like draft a memo or draft a handbook or something like that. But if I need to access like our shared files or if I need to get on the internet to search for something, then I would be blocked on that task. So I try to differentiate those two just because I've had instances where I unintentionally or intentionally don't have access to the internet. I also like that I can look at these next actions list and not be super overwhelmed by an overflowing to-do list. I might have 50 things on my to-do list, but I only have five things on my emails list. So so it just helps me to take my to-do list in smaller bites and not be super overwhelmed by everything that I have to do. My waiting for list, I actually keep in two different places. I have a waiting for email folder, and that's something I talk about in my GTD folder setup video. And then in Todoist, I have a waiting for filter, and that's usually for tasks that I'm waiting for, specifically if I've delegated something to someone, or if I have sent an email to someone and I wanna follow up with them, I'll usually make note of that stuff in Todoist, and then I just add the waiting for tag. And then when I'm doing my weekly review and I get to the step where I need to review all my waiting fors, I just glance at that list and it reminds me to either follow up with people or just gives me a reminder of what I'm still waiting on from folks. I did a video on how you're able to use filters in Gmail and rules in Outlook. So my waiting for emails that I send are automatically put into a waiting for folder anytime I BCC myself on an email. So I don't have to send an email and then make a copy of that email and then drag it to my waiting for folder. It's all just in one step automatically. And I have a, a receipt, if you will, of all the stuff that I am waiting for when I send out an email. My reference material is in a couple of different places, kind of depending on what it is. So for example, my personal paper reference stuff, I have a bin that is way overdue to be replaced. I think I've had this bin like 15 years or something, but uh, it, I mean, it still works. It still holds paper. It's just getting a bit full. And David Allen was absolutely right when he said that if you have an over full bin that you're not going to file things, and I totally don't. I'll just stick papers on top of my file bin instead of actually filing them. Even though it only takes me like 30 seconds to file them, it's still that just 30 seconds is so much longer than the five seconds it takes me to just put it on top. But I know that that means I just need to get a different, bigger file bin. My file bin isn't anything fancy. I have my taxes and I have them by tax year. It helps me around tax time 
when you get all of these random W-2s and all these bank things and to kind of collect all those things so they're not floating around. I just have a folder for that tax year. So I have a 2020 tax year folder and I put all my things in there so that way when I go to do my taxes, I can just pull that folder out and all the stuff that I need to do my taxes is in that one folder. Most of my digital reference stuff is in OneNote. I really like that I can put a password on certain sections in OneNote because some of the reference material that I have is a bit sensitive and private. And I like that I'm able to just have a simple password that other people can't access. I used to keep a list of the things that I wanted to read in Todoist, like random articles that I wanted to read. I try to keep Todoist to be really truly that like my to-do list that I want to feel good about checking things off. With the exception of my someday maybe list, I try not to keep other stuff in there. So like reading lists that I literally can do whatever I want to, whenever I want to or not, I just don't bother putting those in Todoist because I'm always going to remember when I'm standing in line at the grocery store that if I'm bored, I have hundreds of articles that I could read on pocket and just pull those up and, and then I'm done. And then I do some planning stuff with my reference material in OneNote as well. I did a video where I talked about the natural planning model and how I use that to help me plan my holiday for this past year. I'll link that in the description. And then the last is the someday maybe list. I do keep this in Todoist like a lot of people. So I will admit that my someday maybe list is not as outrageous as some people's. However, I do still like to separate things. So it's not just one flowing stream of consciousness. I use sections to differentiate like things I want to buy versus things I need to research versus stuff I want to do. I differentiate things related to my YouTube channel from my personal, from my work. I also have some projects that sometimes I'll move from active projects to someday maybe. And I just nest them within the Sunday maybe project. So that way I know that even though it's got you know, a certain color on it, it's a someday maybe project. And then if I'm ready to make it active again, I can just very easily pull it out and move it into my active projects list but until then it just lives in someday maybe. So that's how I'm doing step three, organize with GTD. In the next video, I'll move on to step four, which is reflect. Be sure to subscribe and hit the bell notification if you wanna be notified when that video comes out next week. Thanks for watching.